Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Assembly. We're blessed that you're here this morning. It is a great Sunday morning. We had a wonderful search service, and that's why we know second will be great. God bless you. Let's stand in the sanctuary in the balcony. Let's in the chapel. And when you're at home, God bless you for the, those of you who are online and faithful. Uh, we're looking towards that day when, when online is only for those who aren't feeling well or something. But for now, God bless you. Pastor Josh, lead us in this great service. Sing peace. Peace. Bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me. Let it break. At your name still. Call the sea to still. The rage in me to still. Every way. How wonderful that we get to get together as God's people, His church. But I want to ask you, did you come this morning feeling a little weak? We sometimes do. Oh, it might be this weakness that's in our spirit where we just say, Oh, Lord, I, I don't feel like I can take a hold of you today. I'm so weak in my spirit. Sometimes it's weakness in our soul where our emotions are just a little fried. I, we don't feel strong in our souls, and sometimes it's our body that's just not strong. 
But did you know the Word of God says that God is our strength? He's the strength of your spirit and your soul and your body. In the Lord Jehovah, Isaiah 26 says, is everlasting strength. Our God even delights in weakness because he says his grace then will make us perfectly strong. Strength that's from him. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. And again, our hearts can lift up in praise. Even, Lord, today if we feel weak, insufficient, because in you, Lord Jehovah, is everlasting strength. Strength for our spirits and our souls and our bodies. And so this morning, we lift our praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
not to enter covenant with you, but it is to fellowship with you, to be a father to you, to be your God, to meet your every need. I am a giver, says your God. I long today to give you everything you need to do my will, to live the supernatural life of an overcomer. I am your father. I am the one who gives. Hold your hands out to me this morning. Open your heart to me. Lift your eyes to me, and I will Take this moment and respond to the tongues and interpretation. Each of us will have something we feel God spoke to us, but I, I heard that part about he wants to give, but our hands aren't open to receive the gifts. So open your heart, open your hands. Say, Lord, what is it you have for me? What calling, what ministry, what blessing? What touch, what is it you have specifically for me, whether it's something tangible, whether it's something deep in my soul, in my emotions, in who I am to change me into who you want me to be. But Lord, we simply wait in your presence. And through it all, show us your glory. Show us your glory. Sunday morning. There wasn't a church to be found because he's on the Isle of Patmos, but he had his own little church there. So he says he was in the spirit, just worshiping the Lord. When all of a sudden he heard this voice and this sound, and it was so amazing, he turned around and he saw Jesus in his glory. As you come into his presence, as you wait in his presence, as you just say, Jesus, I love you, I worship you, I want to move in the spirit, be ready for him to show himself incredibly to you as he did even to John and throughout the Bible and throughout Pentecost he just shows himself strong to those who are ready and wanting him Lord bless thank you Lord for your moving of the spirit thank you Jesus for the, the entire experience of what being with the family of God is about blessed in every way Lord thank you for the great privilege of this service and this life of serving you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen and amen. In the sanctuary you may be seated. Balcony, chapel, at home, get comfortable. Well, I want to welcome you to Calvary Assembly. So glad you're here this morning. It's always a blessing to have you here. You know that. I'm thinking around the world there are places that they can't meet. Communist China is uh, really cracking down. You know, literally tearing down churches that they hadn't let being built, and yet they said, nope, nope, we changed our mind, and they're pulling them down. And some big ones, some, uh, you've seen maybe some of the videos of the sad, of them pulling down steeples and such like. But we're here today. Thank you, Jesus. Let's count it a privilege. Let's count it a privilege. Our website, then, is calvaryassembly.church. Always encourage you. I'm going to talk to you about a lot of things this morning, and any of those things you would find right here. So definitely have that down in your mind of how to get there. It's not the name of our church. We're Calvary Assembly of God. I wanted to say dot God, but we're not dot God. We're just uh, of God. But, uh, you know, this is the place that you go to and things happen. Let me tell you some of the things that may, you should maybe know about. Our annual ministries meeting is coming up next week. It'll be right after this service. It'll be very short. Those of you involved in that, please uh, be part of that. I, I, we won't make it long. We're going to abbreviate it because of COVID and everything else, but encouraging you to be here. Also want to remind you then, at being part of Calvary Assembly, 
that on our Facebook and on our uh, church, online.church, there are live services, whether it's Sunday morning or Wednesday night. You who are here Sunday morning, obviously you know it's here, so uh, praise the Lord. But if for perchance you get sick or something, hey, come on, just turn us on TV or something and watch us there. You online, we're making a challenge over the next couple of weeks to Palm Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, start to come back to the house of God. We're a whole year into this now. And I was thinking, you know, wow, uh, last year at this time we were scrambling, we, we videotaped a sermon and put it on, we had it taped and then we just simply showed it. So the building was empty, nothing went on for literally several months after that except we taped messages and showed them and taped them. And, and praise the Lord, as, as time moved on we were able to, but now we've got this online, but now we're trying to transition back. So God bless you. Don't forget Wednesday nights, the things that are happening here on Wednesday nights, as well as Royal Rangers. Good, good, good reports. Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries. And good things happening there for sure. And then also, I just want to remind you, if you haven't heard, there are several families in our church that lost loved ones, a dad, a granddad, this week. And so uh, Frank and Eliza Birdie, they lost her father. And so if you'd be praying for them, uh, Caesar and Jackie Munez, uh, the, the kids are here too, so they, they lost father, grandfather, and that was very unexpected, so, so please be praying for them. And then Jason and Grace Dueno, uh, his, uh, his father passed on. So Jackie's father, uh, Jason's father, and Elisa's father each passed on. At the, if you didn't get it when you came in, maybe on your way out on the table outside will be a little piece of paper that has their address if you'd like to send a condolence card or if you have their if you have their uh, phone number in your in your phone I, I'd send them a text right now just right now hey pastor just mentioned it I just want you to know I'm thinking of you praying for you knowing God's grace is going to be uh, there for you for those I think they were in the first service I don't know if any of any of them are in the second service or online but our condolences and asking God to greatly help you from the body of Christ from the body of Calvary to you Amen. And then real quick, I wanted to point out that uh, every, every week, weekday morning we have a devotional. And this Friday, so just two days ago, Pastor Josh did one that I thought was so cool. He went out in the front lawn and taped it. And with the church in the background, you could hear the cars driving by. And it was the three levels of relationship with church. Some people kind of have that casual relationship and some people get a little more involved. But some people are really locked in. And you know one thing that this year of COVID has done is it, it's caused some people, I didn't say all people, but some people to say, do I really need church? Now, I hope you would answer yes. I hope you would say, you know, with, without even hesitation. I know I would. However, this is a great devotional. He kept it to three minutes, just a little more than three minutes. You want to go to Facebook. You want to watch that. It was really good. I just commend Pastor Josh for the creativity in that one. And, and just making it work, and obviously the message also. Uh, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. You know, that begins what many people call Holy Week. Starts it out, Jesus enters Jerusalem, Hosanna, the palms, the coats in the road. It set things up for by that Friday, which then, so we're going to have our Palm Sunday service, but then Friday, we are going to have our Good, Good Friday service. And we want to invite you to that service. Next slide, thanks. That will be a communion service. And it will be the 2nd of April, and it will be at 6 o'clock. You may want to mark that number down, just in case, you know, sometimes you do Christmas Eve at 5 and 6. That's, that's the general area now of, of these kind of services. So, encouraging you to be here for the communion service. If you're making plans for the evening, about an hour. About an hour. It will be very reflective in the internal. Once you kind of get the internal of, of what you believe about the cross, then the external of the joy of the Lord and for Easter to come. So if you got Good Friday, next slide, you're going to get Easter. You're going to get Easter because Easter is the product of Good Friday. Easter was made possible by Good Friday. So be with us, 9, 30, and 11. I simply remind you to register online, especially if you've been coming and not registering. This one you've got to register for because you just never know with Easter crowds. You never know. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a problem, but at least if you register, we'll know whether it's you know, maybe the main floor is filled and you have to go to the balcony or you have to come to the early service or the, or the later service or something like that. So encouraging you to sign up, surely, for every week up till Easter, but definitely uh, Easter Sunday morning. 
And then I want to remind you, ladies, that there is an Abide Conference coming up. It is their yearly women's convention or conference, but it, because of COVID, they did not have it early in the year, but they moved it to May, and they'll be having limited seating down at the main place. And then the director has asked some of the churches that have the capability of doing it to host a simulcast. We are one of them, and we are going to do it together. I'm encouraging you to be part of it, ladies. Uh, we need you to help as we host other churches. And, of course, uh, it's going to be a great day. $29 with lunch. Here is the, the uh, QR code. QR code. If you take your phone, put it on there, you can register right now. Or if you simply go to the website, which we talked about before, and you go to the register page, there's many things you can register for, including this particular one. Finally, finally, I want to just simply encourage you to give. I want to encourage you to give. I want to thank you tell you how proud I am for the giving that for the year since it's been 12 months since it's been 12 months I know some churches have struggled and, and I'm not saying things are like over the top but I am saying God's people have been faithful and I want to thank you for your faithfulness I'll even mention it more in the sermon you have three ways to do it in person by mail online can I encourage you if, if this is only because you just haven't got around to it. Now, if you have some thoughts about whether you'd like to do online or not, I can get that. I get that. I get that part. Some people, that's, that's the way they operate. Fine. But if it's simply because I just never got to it yet, I don't have any qualms about it. I just never got to it. Can I encourage you? Switch over to online. It will make, it'll make your life easier. It'll make it more consistent. And it will surely help uh, in our running our church smoothly and getting it done. Well, with that said and done, I'm going to encourage you to take your Bibles with me, please. And we are going to preach the blessed life. Number five. Number five. Here we go. John 12, verses 1 through 6. John 12, 1 through 6. I don't know why I've been enjoying this so much, but I've been enjoying this so much. Uh, I readily admit that the preparation is a little bit, um, I don't know, it's like making a meal. When you make a meal, there's the, there's the part of making the meal. There, there's, it takes work. But then when you sit down to the meal, there's such an enjoyment. So this is, uh, the meal has been prepared. Now I'm sitting down with you, getting to share the word of God. I am super duper excited. Jesus wants you to know about the blessed life. How do I know he wants you to know? Is that an, is, am I exaggerating when I say that? Well, we go to the beginning of the New Testament. Jesus, uh, Matthew 1, the, the lineage of Jesus, uh, the, the Joseph finding out that Mary is pregnant, chapter 2, uh, the wise men, and on and on, chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus, chapter 4, uh, him going into the desert, being tempted by the devil, 40 days fasting, and praying and then tempted by a devil, but he comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit and chapter 5 is the very first sermon that Jesus preaches in his ministry, his ready-to-go earthly ordained ministry. Chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 are what you and I would call technically a sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. The opening words of his Sermon on the Mount, the introduction, the, hey, this sets it up for the rest of it are eight, nine, or ten, depending on how you look at it, beatitudes. A beatitude is simply Jesus saying, you will be blessed if you do this. You will be blessed if you do this. You will be blessed if you do this. We will be blessed. The church will be blessed. People will be blessed if they do this. Hence, the blessed life. Now, they're not only in that particular part of it. Those aren't the only blessings of the Bible. But there are many other blessings, and that's what we're going to cover today when we talk about you and I as givers, our hearts wanting to give to God. So the blessed life starts with your heart. It's not about rules. Some people would like to take everything that God asks, put it under a, a category called rules or legalism, and then dismiss it. Now, I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to do that. But no, it's not about rules. It's about a heart and a heart like God's heart. Today we show God's heart is a heart of abundant generosity. The blessed life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, cause the blessed life to, 
to start to spark inside of us. Lord, I really do pray at the beginning of this that most people get rid of the dollar sign in front of this particular sermon series. God, I know it includes dollars. I, I, I'm not going away from that. I'm not saying the tithe is, isn't for most of us represented by the dollar. But, but Lord, it's so much more than that. It just represents what's going on in the inside. And Jesus, I need us to... I want the Holy Spirit to show us so deeply that the person with that kind of heart, that generous heart, that heart that wants the ministry done and wants it done God's way, it's going to be the heart that's blessed. That's the blessed life. Blessed are those that. So we pray, Lord, that happens today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, give me just a few seconds to cover the past four Sundays. Now, why do I do that? Because some of you weren't here last week. Some of you are forgetful. And some of you, well, are probably like me that, you know, even though I preach it, it sure does help me to go over it a few times. So when we did the very first one, the very first Sunday, we said it's about your heart. Giving isn't about money or time. Oh, it's about money. It's about giving time. It includes those, but giving is about your heart. And it's all about your heart. That's why we say tithing isn't a money issue. It is a heart issue. If you say tithe, oh, he's going to talk about money. You're not allowed to say that anymore. Stop. You're not allowed to say that. Tithing is about your heart. Just like obedience is about a heart. It's not about the action. Obedience has to start, tithing, which is an obedience, has to start with the heart. And then we went to the second Sunday and we talked about Malachi 3.10. Try me, prove me, test me in this. Because tithing is a test. Tithing is a test. Tithing shows whether or not your heart, hence your treasure, is in the right place. So tithing is a test, and tithing is 10%. 10%. This is easy. You've heard it before. If you made a dollar this week, you, are, you then should be giving a dime. If you made $10 million this week, don't you dare gag on this. It's a million dollars. And that's just the way God set it up. So, do you tithe... And then there's a simple term, 10% of what God has given you of increase. You, you, not the next guy. Now some guys, they want to they they juggle the numbers. They want to juggle the numbers and they say, yeah, I give $50 a week. Yeah, but you make $5,000 a week. Oh, but I give $50 a week and there's people who don't give anything. That's not 10%. Do you tithe? The only way you can say answer yes is if you give the 10%. So what exactly then would be 10%. Well, uh, here's, this is easy. This, I, I have your answer. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Take your W-2 form for 2020. Hold it up. There is, I don't know which box it is. I should have figured this out. But it's box two, whatever, some box. Go to box two. That is your income for the year. Now, get that nice little piece of paper that our church office sends you called your giving for the year. That has a box and a total. Now compare the two boxes. Is one 10% of another? That answers the question. It's so easy. It is so easy. And yet there are those who would want to say, I am so faithful, but they're not. And there may be others that can say, hey, you know, I think I'm moving beyond just the tithe, I'm, I'm going to be on. And first thing, so beyond those things. So don't juggle the numbers. Number three was first things first. Remember we said firstborn, first fruits, tithing is first. Did any of you this week get your stimulus check? I, I was checking my bank account. And I have, at least the bank that I, I bank with, they have a thing called pending. Pending. It's either pending to be deposited or pending that they're going to release it, but it is pending and it's kind of locked in at that point. But you really don't have it. So it said that Uncle Sam was sending me money. I was so thankful, except it said your money is pending. Okay, I can handle pending. In faith, I can wait. You know, and so, but you know what I did? I said, I'm going to beat, the, I'm going to beat the curve here. I'm going to tithe on this before it's unpending, before it's released. And so before they ever actually said I could use that money, I went to Calvary Subsplash for the Calvary giving and I gave. 
And when I gave, I just, I felt like, Pastor, you're starting to get what you're preaching. First things first. First fruits. Because tithing is to be the first payment to leave your hand. And then finally, last week, we preached on the spirit of mammon. Mammon. We said mammon was a very unused word. Except what was really funny this week. I have an app on my phone that's called Word Thirst. And every so often, I think it's weekly, maybe it's more, they send me a word that is so cool that if you drop it in your vocabulary, people will think you're like, whoa. They will say, this guy is like, he knows words that most people don't know. Now, usually when they send me a word, I can't even pronounce it. And there's no way I'm going to have a context to use it, so I, pro I don't know that I've hardly ever used any of the words they've sent me. I've, I've read them, and I, and I try to get them up here, but I'm kind of a simple guy. That's all there is to it. But did you know what the word was this week? Mammonism. The, week, the word for the week was mammonism. And this is how they described it. The greedy pursuit of riches. The greedy pursuit of riches. Last week, we preached against mammonism. Hey, I used it in a sentence. There you go. Your pastor is intelligent. Huh? 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 He may not have much going for him, but he can say a word that has like all those syllables at one time. So I am so impressed. The spirit of mammon, or like we said, mammonism. Here was the incredible thought, though. We know that the that income that is not tithed on, that is not tithed on, is automatically cursed. You can't uncurse it. You can't make it. It, it is. It is. And then what Jesus said, because that's what Malachi 3.9 says, not what Calvary says, not what Pastor B says, what Malachi says, the Word of God says. But here's the worst part. Here's the worst part of the curse on that money. It becomes to the person who doesn't tithe on it their idol. And you might say, no, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to tithe, but I'm not going to let it become my idol. There is no choice to that. There is no, no, you're not going to be an idol. Because Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. You can't defer obedience to God and still say, I'm serving God. So what does he say? Then it becomes mammonism. It becomes the guilty pursuit. It becomes cursed in your life. Because anybody who has an idol in their life, that's not good. You know it, and I know it. So that's what we tried to cover before, and we've had such good results. Such um, so, uh, People have done well in responding and saying, thank you, Pastor, thank you, Pastor, and, and I think they've kind of, you know, stepped up to the plate. So this week, now we jump into it real quick. We say, this is the question I'm going to ask you this week, and I'm going to show you a story from the Bible of a person who got this whole tithing thing, which led them to offerings, which led them to extravagant offerings. Am I generous? Am I generous? Am I generous? Before I jump into this, though, let me simply say this. I, I want to say how proud I am of the people of Calvary. How proud I am. Um, <clears throat> if I had asked you, if I had taught on prayer, and then I saw more people praying, more people praying over others, more people uh, dedicating themselves to prayer, and, and in, in a daily devotion and everything else, I would, I would quickly say, I am so proud. If I had preached on witnessing, sharing your faith in Jesus, and I saw you out there winning people to Jesus Christ, I would say, I'm so proud. If I had preached on serving Christ on a local practical level, whether you teach in a class or, or minister to, say, the maintenance of the building and, and everything else, and people responded, I'd say, I, I'm proud. So tithing, let me say this to this congregation, I am so proud. I am so proud that so many, I don't know that everybody has, I don't, I don't have that information, but... I'm just so proud that, generally speaking, people have not dropped the ball. They keep holding on to it. They've got the baton. They're going to race with that baton. And one day when the next generation comes along, they will have the authority to give it to someone else. In fact, that's what I, Sister B and I were talking about this, and I thought it was a great thought. Sister B said, you know why you can preach so, uh, so easily and so liberally and so, with so much conviction about tithing? It's easy, because you tithe. What you do, you can share. What you don't do, you have a little bit of a tough time convincing anybody else from any kind of deep well within you. So let me just say, I'm proud of you. So today, tithing allows you to experience the joy and inner peace of being a generous giver. Between now and the final story, I'm going to tell you a story about a generous giver. Real quick, I want to read to you these verses, real quick. Math, uh, sorry, John 
verses 1, 2, 3, and then we're going to go to 4, 5, 6. Then six days before the Passover, now this is chapter 12, they're in Bethany, they're at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Chapter 11, whoa, chapter 11 was so much different than chapter 12. Chapter 11 started so sad, chapter 12 was so happy. But then it says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, how many people can you say that about? Who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus is one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary, now take note who's doing this, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and when she poured this uh, perfume out, the house was just filled with an incredible fragrance of that oil. Then one of the disciples, now he is going to say this was stupid. He is going to say this was ridiculous. This was foolish. Before you look up here, don't look, don't look. I see that you're looking. Don't look, don't look. But before he said that, take note. Then one, uh, sorry, next verse. Next, uh, there it is. Don't look, don't look. Who do you think it was? Who do you think would say to Jesus, you shouldn't do that? It was somebody who down here says was a thief. Who says things like that? Simon, son, poor Simon, Man, my kid. Whew. Who would betray him said, what? what? Why was this, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Commentary. This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. <clears throat> you read verses 1 through 6, and instantly two huge questions come to your mind. Here's the first question. Why would Mary give such an extravagant gift? What were you thinking, Mary? What were you thinking? Why give so much? The other question is, Judas, what's the problem? Why does this bother you so much? What, why does this get under your skin so deeply? Two huge questions. The answers reveal this. The answers reveal what kind of a heart a person has. In extravagant giving situations, even giving situations, either a person has a heart of generosity or a person is super selfish. They are selfish. Remember what Sermon 1 said, it all starts with the heart. It all starts with the heart. You know, I like the Nigerian proverb. It, you, you like it. It says, it is the heart that does the giving. It is the fingers that only let it go but it's the heart that does the giving. The fingers, just all they get to do is only let it go. Tithing reveals who you really are. Tithing reveals who you really are deep down inside, for it expresses what kind of heart you have. Number one, the enemy of, of this whole generosity of tithing is this. Listen, turn my heart towards your statutes, your word, or else it's going to go the other direction. You cannot serve God and mammon, mammonism. My heart, turn my heart towards your word and not towards selfish gain. The enemy of generosity is selfishness. One of, the, one of the easy ways to remember this is God starts with G, which is generosity. S starts with Satan, which is selfishness. Okay, now I kind of got it. I mean, at least it gives me a picture to remember. I, you know, I, that's not a Bible verse, but it does give me a picture to remember. When our hearts are challenged with generosity we usually, instead of just jumping on board, the natural response of this is to look at someone else and say, uh, let me see. We look for somebody who has a better car, a better house, and a better standard of living. And then this is what we do. We say, you know, they should be a giver. You know, they really should give more. We try to deflect. We try to take the attention off our own selves, and we do this by ourselves. Literally, we do it for ourselves also, and for others, and we say, you know, there was one guy standing with another guy, and he said, look at that guy. He's got such a nice house. He ought to sell that and put it into the ministry. He said it, and the other guy said, well, turned to him and said, well, why don't you sell your house? Yeah, it's, it's always amazing. We're willing for others to sacrifice, but, oh, I don't know about me. I don't know about me when it comes to this. 
Let me tell you what happens when we deflect the attention. You know what we're doing? You know what your heart is doing? You are snookering yourself. That's another big word, and, and word thirst didn't even give it to me. You are being snookered. You know what snookered means? It means that you've been faked out. You've been tricked. You've been enticed into something that you weren't even, you didn't even know. It's a smoke screen. Smoke screens you put up so people can't tell what's really going on behind the smoke. Oh, Mary pours out her extravagant offering to Jesus. Judas, uncontrolling. He does, maybe Peter and James and John are thinking it, but they're, even the guys who have a mouth, and those three had mouths, the sons of thunder and Peter, they could, they could say a lot of things. But they did not say it then. They kept their mouths closed. But Judas could not. Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And Judas borts out, that money should have been given to the poor. To which later John writes commentary and he says, he didn't care about the poor. He had no thought about the poor. His whole thought was, he wanted some of that for himself. He wanted to keep what should have been given to God for himself. You know, Jesus was the one who appointed Judas to be the money keeper. Jesus, way before this, way before this, said, I pick you 12, but one of you is the devil, is the son of a devil. One of you is. Jesus knew it, and yet when it came time to say, all right, we've got a money bag here. Somebody's got to be the treasurer of this group. And he looks over at Judas, and he says, Judas, you do it. What was Jesus thinking? And was Jesus simply setting Judas up for failure? I believe the answer would be no. Jesus was setting Judas up to see if he could change that all around and pass that test, not fail that test. God gives us opportunities in life, including tithing, to see if we'll pass the test or we'll fail the test. Tithing is a test. Tithing is a test for you and I. That's what we said in week two. And Judas was a thief... And the Bible, not me, but the Bible says, calls the non-tither a robber of God, a thief. The first fruit is to be put into the offering plate. The first, the first of what God has given you, first things first, is to be put in the offering plate. They belong to God. Here's my guess about this group of people that I'm preaching to online, other rooms. Here's this guess. Here's my guess. None of you would ever, remember before COVID we used to pass the offering plate? Remember that? The good old days? And we'd pass the offering plate. Do you remember when you, somebody beside you'd put some money in and you'd drive, and you maybe if you glance down, especially if you're putting something in, you've got to glance down, you may see some big bills, big bills inside the offering plate. So let's just say the guy beside you puts in three $100 bills. They are semi-stuck together, and when he puts them in, they just kind of stick out the top. They're just sticking out the top. They are like right there. And as the plate goes by, all of a sudden your eyes just scan and you realize there is not one person in the building looking at you as that goes by. Not one! Here's my guess. Not one person in here would take the money out. Put it in their pocket. Not one of you. Not one. I didn't say one of you wouldn't be tempted, but, I I just, but that you wouldn't do it. I just said you wouldn't do it. I just do not believe you would do it. I just believe your, your commitment to even be in the house of God says that that's not what you're going to do. But wait. But wait. What if you have your tithe in your pocket already and you don't put it in the plate? Is that any different? Is that the same? Is it? You answer that question. I, if I answer it, I simply say it's the same thing. The enemy of generosity... It's not the devil. I mean, selfishness is not, is not a person. You and I can be the enemy of generosity. Sometimes when we need to fight a battle, it's not we'll go out and fight the devil. We need to fight ourselves. Fight yourself to win, to win and not be. Not be an enemy of generosity. Number two then, when instead of being an enemy, we want to move on to extravagance of generosity. Proverbs 11.25, 11.25. Oh, man, let's fly like the wind here. 
Proverbs 11.25, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh themselves will also be refreshed. Isn't that a beautiful verse? You know, you come to church and you say, who's going who's gonna to minister to me? Who's going to lift me up? Who's going to make me feel good? Pastor, you better have a feel-good sermon this morning. Oh man, Mr. Usher, make me feel good. Oh friend who's in the next pew, make me feel good. But my word, my Bible says, you refresh others and amazing magic happens. When you're done refreshing, pouring into someone else, when you're done, you feel refreshed. Ah, oh, there are those that have in their hand and they give and they give and they give and they still have more. There are those that hold it stingily and they let no one even look at it and when they open their hand, it's half gone. What happened? This is the word of God. This is God speaking to us. We read the passage from John 12 where Jesus is in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Mary does an act of generosity that is not just an offering, but this is like, this has to raise to the, and we're going to prove this here in a second, raises to the place of extravagance of an offering, extravagant offering, extravagant generosity. Two, two things happen at that time as she gives this extravagant offering. Number one, Judas condemns it, but number two, Jesus extols it. He says, you see what happened right there? You see this? I want the whole world to know about this. Wherever this gospel is preached, I want people to know about this lady's generosity. I want them to know about it. In fact, the Bible has a lot of extravagant stories of giving in it. Uh, Mary's obviously one of them. Do you know King David, when it came time to build the temple, though he would not build it himself, they needed the supplies, he said, let me give as extravagant as I can. And he gave tons of precious metals. Tons. In fact, they say if it was in today's dollars, it would be 21 billion dollars. Not million, billion dollars. I mean, we're getting way up there to like the top five richest people in the world or some number like that. And yet, Jesus also pointed out and just to prove to us that it's not about actually the total, but it's about what's in the heart and the sacrifice. He stands by the money box in the temple and up walks that lady with two pennies, two mites. She drops him in, and Jesus, his breath is taken away. And he turns and he says, did you see that? Did you see it? All those other guys are given bags of money that mean nothing to them. It's chump change. But she gave out of everything she had. That was, and Jesus would call that extravagant generosity, extravagant giving. Oh, Romans 12.1 you see, extravagant gifts, well, let me say this first. Extravagant gifts to God will move in an area called, and here's a word that you and I should not run from, but literally let our lives be defined by sacrifice. Romans 12.1, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Monday night, I was with some other pastors. It was a missions banquet. Uh, as, we, as the speaker got up and he told us about a missionary from New Jersey, an Assemblies of God missionary, that in the 1920s went to Liberia, Africa as a single woman missionary. Liberia is to the west of, for those of you who know, like say know where our, our uh, friends from Ghana are from, you go west about 600 miles-ish and you find Liberia. She went there in the 1920s. She stayed 40 years, including through World War II, which had to be an incredible time in that whole area of the world. As he's speaking, he pulls out of, of a bag a straw mat. It is tattered. It is falling apart. It is maybe this wide, maybe five feet long. It is, in my opinion, a piece of cardboard would have been better than that mat. He said, this is something that we received after she passed on. And this was her bed for 40 years. This is what she slept on. And all of a sudden, anything I've ever done that I would call sacrifice just kind of fizzled and disappeared. I just felt like, wow, this lady understood extravagant giving. She understood extravagant giving. Her name was Emily de Grote. Again, sometimes I think I sacrificed for God, but this, lady, this lady's life was, the whole life was a sacrifice. And you know where she was, interestingly enough, in a leper colony. I mean, that even makes this story like 10 times better. 
or 10 times worse or 10 times sacrifice. That's for sure. Mary brings a bottle of perfume, pours it on Jesus' feet. It is worth 300 denarii. That is a year's wage. Let's take the average salary of households, say, in our congregation. Well, no, let's go beyond. Let's just say this area of New Jersey, this northeast area of New Jersey. Some people will be making minimum, minimum wage, but some will be making 30, 40, 50,000. But then there are some households that will be making 100, 150,000, maybe 200,000. So I don't know what the average number would be. I should have looked it up. I don't. But just let's, let's pick something in there. Let's say $70,000 would be an average household income. Mary comes and takes out that. Takes out $70,000 and she gives it to the ministry. That would be an extravagant, generous offering. But now the drama comes in. She did not hand this to Jesus and say, Jesus, please sell this for $70,000 and, and make it so that we can preach the gospel more. Make it so the ministry can go on. Maybe you can be, have a chariot to ride in instead of having to walk everywhere, something like that. Maybe you can get a nicer looking robe. I don't know, whatever. She did not say that. Instead, she walks over to Jesus. She kneels down. She takes $70,000. $70,000. She pours it on his feet. I'm thinking in my mind, there's just probably a dirt floor there in that time, that age, that, that makeup. It's just dirt. The, the, the perfume goes over the feet. The room fills with the fragrance. You know that. It's like almost like a scented candle, but a hundred times over. And then in a second, it just goes down into the dirt. All you got is a wet spot on the floor. One minute it is worth $70,000. The next minute, as far as selling it, it's worth nothing. Nothing. What impresses God about our giving? What impresses God about our giving? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the silver and the gold in every mine. He's got a heaven with, with, with streets of gold, foundations of precious stones, gates of pearl. Does God care about $70,000. Here's what, what impresses God is when it is a sacrifice for you to do it. Not the mount. Two mites was a sacrifice for the one lady. For Mary, it happened to be $70,000. But what does it represent? It represents the ultimate sacrifice that all of us should be giving, first and foremost, so that the rest of this can come into play, that we give ourselves. Have you given yourself your ultimate sacrifice. Because you take your life and you give it a worth, you give it a $70,000 mark, you give it whatever mark it is, but when you give yourself to Jesus, he can do anything and everything he wants to with it. And if you say, oh man, it's worth a lot the way it is, he can take it and make it worth nothing if he wants to. When you give yourself, the ultimate gift is yourself. Second Corinthians. They did, not, they did even more than we had hoped for. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. And then after they gave themselves to the Lord, they even gave themselves to the body of Christ, to us also, as God just wanted them to do. Extravagant giving. Wouldn't you love to be an extravagant giver? God, oh yeah, if I had a billion dollars, I would be. Stop. Do not put an amount on it. Anybody in this room, the poorest person in this room, can be an extravagant giver to God. And I'm not talking about that now. And now you move out and live in a cardboard box. I'm simply saying God can put in your life so many things that, that you can just give to God, do for God, be for God. There are three levels of giving for every Christian and every Christian should experience. There's tithing, offerings, and extravagant offerings. Sometimes extravagant offerings have been called sacrificial offerings. Sometimes painful offerings because sacrifices is often for us, unless we're really over the top, it's going to be somewhat of a, of a sacrifice of a pain. But when you give it, when you give it, and now we're not talking about tithes. Tithes is just 10%, and tithes is undesignated. You don't give your tithe and then say, hey, and here's my tithe, give it to missions. You can't say that, or it's not a tithe. It's controlled. You can't control your tithe. You give it, and you just give it to the house of God, the local storehouse. You know, what's interesting is people sometimes want their tithe to control, and so they, they, they change this tithe to bribe. I bribed the church. 
so they would let me uh, do this or do that or be this or be that. Just, I'm sorry, we don't accept bribes here. Just, just in case you were thinking, it ain't going to work. Sorry, we don't, don't even bring it. Don't even bring it. In fact, I won't say there's a church down the street that's waiting for you, but I, I wouldn't say that. But then there's above our tithes, are there, there's offerings. But here's what God allows you to do every once in a while in a lifetime. You can't do it every day because you, you have to, there's an extravagance, and when you do it, you, you're going to, as it were, give away what meant something, and so there's not going to be anything left to give after that in this sense. But every once in a while in a lifetime, God gives you opportunity to do something extravagant for him. Your prayer wants to be that, God, someday I want to do something extravagant for you. You say, I'll never get there. Ah, I got good news. Good news, good news. Here we go. Next slide, thank you. The good news is this, that when you get to the first level, that is tithing, it breaks the curse, it opens the windows of heaven to give you a blessing you can, oh, what were the words? Cannot contain. Well, if you've got more than you need, you can't contain it. Why are you holding on to it? Give it to God. Give it to God. Do something extravagant for God because it opens the windows of heaven. It has broken the curse and that allows you to give offerings and ultimately one day, maybe a couple times during your lifetime, you will be given an extravagant offering. My prayer for you at this point is that you would have a heart that at several times in your lifetime you could have an extravagant giving experience in your life. And the reason I say that is because too many people have exempted themselves. They've said, I can never have an extravagant offering. And, and they've said, that's for the lucky ones. That's for those who just, God just, too bad I can't. No, you can. You can. Mary was no different. The woman with two mites was no different. David was no, they were just simply men and women of God. Men and women of God, you have you will have that choice. But remember, remember, you can't say to God, oh, no, 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 God. Uh, and, you know, here's the funny thing that too many Christians do, and I'm going to guess that all of us have done. We spend more time praying about what we don't want God to do in our lives than what we do want God to do in our lives. We get down and we say, Lord, you know, that was a great service for missionaries, but please don't ever ask me to be a missionary. Lord, that, that was a great set of sermons on giving, but please don't ask me to give like that. Oh, Lord, I know that we need some teachers and, and Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries, and, but please, please never ask me to do that. Don't ask me. We spend all this time asking God the things that we don't want to do. Here's what I would say. Let your prayer be this. God, ask me anything. Ask me anything. I am ready to obey. You don't want to be the rich young ruler. He walks up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, and he says it with a confidence. What is he doing? He's thinking Jesus cannot come up with anything that I can't blow him out of the water with, with my lifestyle. He obeyed the Ten Commandments. He obeyed the law of Moses. He was like squeaky clean. And he walks up to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I half think, and he was expecting Jesus to say, you already got it. What are you asking me for? And Jesus looks beyond his outer man, looks to the inner heart, and he says, one thing you lack, sell all that you have, come follow me. And it was that one thing. Oh, Lord, don't ask me to do that. Instead of saying, Lord, ask me anything, and I'll do it for you. Can you say amen this morning? And then finally, real quickly, we wrap it up with this, the reward of generosity. I tell you the truth that whoever, wherever the good news is preached, now, that was John 12 we read of that story. This is repeated. The story is repeated in the Gospel of Mark in the 14th chapter. Jesus says of the same instance, this story, wherever this is preached throughout the earth, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Mary didn't pour it out saying, oh boy, everybody's going to look at what a great, great lover of Jesus I am. Hey, everybody, look at this. 70,000 bucks. Hey, 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 take a whiff of this. You know, she didn't walk around doing that. She didn't walk around doing it. It was almost like she was oblivious that she was so focused on Jesus that I'm wondering if she even noticed anybody was in the room. Isn't it good when your life is so focused on Jesus that the voices around you don't keep you from serving him? The voices, and they're chattering everywhere. Oh, don't do it, 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 don't do it. You know, or whatever, you know? I don't know, did Martha say, why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? Stop it. I, I don't know, I don't know. She was so practical. All I know is this, she didn't want the accolades, she just wanted to love Jesus. But God wanted her remembered. 
God wanted her remembered. Remember I said Judas was aghast. But Jesus said, this is a story we need to tell. And why did he want to tell the story? Because he wanted Mary's generosity to cause others to be generous. When you see someone who's generous, when you see someone who's walking in the way of the Lord, we talked about it recently in one of the Wednesday night Bible studies, being an example. Well, when you're an example, did you know that your example is not just like just for you? Okay, you did it good. God says thanks for being good. But now other people will know how to do it. We are so much a society, we are so much a people that I need to see somebody doing it before I know how to do it or want to do it. Hey, you do it and see what God does. Your generosity will spur others on to generosity, multiplying the effect of your original act of generosity. But still, some might say, well, but I don't get it. Why did she do such a huge amount of money? Maybe that was her dowry for getting married with. I can only think that's why you'd hold on to 70,000 bucks like that. Maybe it was because, why was she grateful? Because two months earlier, her brother, they were close. The love of her life, her brother. I don't know their, the sequence, but she just loved her brother. I don't know if he was the oldest, whatever. All I know is this, she loved him so much and he died. But Jesus came and because of Jesus, because of Jesus, he wasn't dead anymore. If he did that for your family, wouldn't you have a little bit of gratitude? But wait, he has done it for your family because he's done it for you. Ephesians 2, 1. Ephesians 2, 1 clearly says, he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. You and I should be the most grateful people in the world. So let's, let's, let's put it all together and then close with a close with a quick thought and a story. God will always reward, God, rather, grateful people are givers. Grateful people are givers. God always rewards generosity. Generosity is when you give and expect nothing in return, even though you know God is gonna give you, because God cannot, you cannot outgive God. I'm not saying that we're just saying, God, no, there are the promises of the word of God, and they are conditional statements. If you do this, I will do this. Then selfishness is when you give, and you just think, God, I'm the cat's meow. You, you owe me big time. You see, God is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. He, in fact, he rewards the generous giver. I want to point out this final verse as we close. Give me a Hebrews, right here it is. You know, we often focus on the top half of this verse, and I know we mention the bottom half of it. But this word rewarder, especially in the Greek, it simply means God likes to give extravagantly. That's neat. God likes to give extravagantly. If I said to you, God is a loving God, you'd go amen, because the Bible proves that. If I said to you, God is a merciful God, you'd go amen. The Bible just speaks that over and over. If I said to you, God is a compassionate God, you'd go, oh, I know that's true. God gives grace, well, I know that's true, because I read it in the Bible. You read in the Bible that he's a rewarder also. It is part of who he is. He can't be anything but. He can't not reward you if you follow his ways. He is a rewarder. And remember, the Bible says because he's a rewarder, part of who he is, his character that God does not change yesterday, today, and forever Jesus is, so is God, he will reward you. The blessed life. The blessed life. I close with this simple story and then let's, let's close in prayer. When Sister B and I first started here at Calvary, now we're going back quite a few years ago, God gave us people in our lives and still gives us people in our lives. But in those days, I, it, it sticks in my mind that he has given me dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of stories of people who have been generous with us, who have loved us so much. And in loving us, they did it because we were their pastors and pastors, they wanted to bless the, the shepherd and in essence, do it for Jesus' sake. I could tell you a hundred stories, but one I'm gonna remember really well, of a person in our church who had love and generosity that perhaps I am your pastor today because of her love and generosity. Her name was Willie Dean. She was short, she was plump. She was a single mom raising a son. She lived in a poor part of town. She drove old cars. Her old car always needed a muffler. And if it didn't need a muffler, it needed new tires. And sometimes both, sometimes both. 
At that time, Sister B and I had five children. When we started here, we had an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 5-year-old, and a 3-year-old. When we looked at our salary and we looked at the needs of living, there wasn't enough salary to make this happen. It was not going to happen, except God, but God. It wasn't going to happen. But then there was this lady called Willie Dean. She was not rich, I'm telling you that. She'd always bring us something. I'd get in the car, look down there on the floor, and there was a ham sitting there. A whole ham. You know, the bone sticking out. Of, there's a whole ham sitting there right on my floor. Get in my car the next time, there's a huge bottle of, of, of uh, washing detergent for the washing machine so we can wash our clothes. The next week, ha, 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 the next week, there was a pot of what we, what we dubbed greasy cabbage. Oh, she was the best. At she was from the South. Greasy cabbage. I don't know. There was like one pound of cabbage and 700 pounds of bacon in it. I'm telling you. There's manna, but then there's greasy cabbage. It was wonderful. Worldly speaking, she had very little to be happy about. Worldly speaking. But let me tell you, if I'm thinking about the happiest people I've met in a lifetime, she's one of them. She was one of them. She had a super love for the kingdom, and it brought her happiness to give. It brought her joy. When, she had a, when you have a generous heart, it does something. It makes you almost blind to your circumstances and simply opens the door of joy to your life. She'd gather up all the kids in her neighborhood, put them in that clunker, and drive them to church. And she always got there, and she always got home. It was wonderful. We had, such a, we had so many young people in our church because of, of what she did. Her generosity, I want to just say, is part of the foundation of my life. Generosity. The series, The Blessed Life, isn't just about tithing. It's about generosity. It's about just knowing that God wants to use you. Yes, God gives, and let's be ready to receive, but God wants to use you. Be a giver, and you'll be a tither. Be a giver, and you bless the kingdom. And ultimately, generosity opens the door to a joyful life. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we are thankful, Lord, that you said, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Lord, and we are thankful that we are the recipients of such a blessing. And Lord, when our own hearts and our own worldly system and the spirit of mammon fights against us, Lord, may we... Stand strong. May we conquer in the name of Jesus with the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. Lord, may it be that men and women find new liberality, new, new things, Lord, that just release them. Selfishness are chains. But generosity and gratefulness is such freedom, is such joy. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't know what the Holy Spirit has said to you in the past. Whoa, it's been a long sermon, 40 minutes. But may you take what he has said and allow it to be used to remold your life into the image of one who is generous, as our God is. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for these people. Thank you for their hearts, God. I've, what a privilege, what a privilege to be here today in a time such as this. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you for the extra time. Uh, you online, God bless you. We're going to see you Wednesday night. Don't forget Wednesday night and the other things we mentioned coming up in the next week. God bless. If you stay in your chairs, our usher will come and he'll, uh, he'll dismiss you by quadrants.